Let's talk money. Hello and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk Money. I'm your host, Surabhi Upadhyay. A lot of you have been writing in to us, sending us questions not on mutual funds or on fixed deposits or any of those traditional investment avenues, but unlisted shares. And that really got us thinking that uh, the information flow is real. Everyone is aware of a lot of the newer products that are out there in the market. And now with the tax changes in budget 2024, perhaps a lot of investors are giving unlisted equities a serious thought because taxation has become favorable. But the question is, should you uh, look beyond the FOMO? And are you equipped with all the knowledge that one needs to dabble in the world of unlisted equities? Are you aware of the risks that could be at play? Well, this is a classroom, so hang in there and listen to every word that our guests have to say, because while this could be a very exciting journey, it could also be a risky one, so beware of the risks. Let's uh, straight away dive in. Our guests on the show today are Deepak Shanoi of Capital Mine, and here in the studios I have with me Pranab Unyal, who is the Head of Investment Advisory at HDFC Securities. Gentlemen, great to have you with us on what's That's a true. really hot topic, right? Because these days, even, you know, some of uh, my friends or my my younger cousins, they'll say that, hey, you know, what's happening and uh, can we get Swiggy in the, in the unlisted market pre-IPO? You know, I want to buy the next hot right. stock. And that really got me thinking that this is serious business. It's serious money that we're talking about. Uh, but uh, perhaps it's a, it's a cool thing that people want to latch on to, right? Uh, and I just want to sort of uh, give a sampling of the questions that we're getting on Twitter as well, or Twitter or other social media platforms, X and the other platforms, uh, before we get started, gentlemen. So let's just put this out. We put up the, the tease and then, you know, Deepak was reposting about it as well. And we, we were flooded, our timelines were flooded with questions about where do we stand versus VCs and, you know, what are the right kind of companies to invest in or not? Are valuations better if you buy unlisted stocks? So great questions. Hang in there. The experts are going to answer each and every one. Gentlemen, opening thoughts. Deepak, let me start with you first. Thanks, Sarvi. I think uh, uh, the unlisted space is interesting in the sense that uh, uh, it seems to have become uh, the new Bitcoin in a way uh, because it's this new shiny object that seems to be around. But it's been one of the oldest forms of investing, right? So your friend starts a company, uh, takes some money from you, gives you equity in your company, and then hopes to grow it uh, to a large size. He could take it to you from you as debt. He could take it from you as equity. Debt is something that he will return the money at some point. If it's equity, then you grow with the company. Hopefully, he takes it public at some point or sells the company, and you earn a profit. So uh, unlisted shares, uh, you know, as an asset class, existed for a while. It's just that because the new startups that are starting to list on the exchanges and people who've got unlisted shares at the time when the company was not listed. After the company lists, they get this big profit, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, potentially what's driving a lot of the uh, you know action here. No, absolutely. Uh, Pranab, your thoughts. I'm, I'm, and you talked to a lot of affluent clients, right? Mm -hmm. UH&I earlier. This was the playground of the rich and famous. But now, like I'm telling you, that people who are viewers of the show, who typically would invest in mutual funds, right. they also want a piece of the action. Yes. W what are your opening thoughts? Uh, you know, further to you know, Deepak's point, unlisted for us is basically broken into two parts, right? One is the VC mm -hmm. uh, early stage part, where obviously, you know, these guys need the funding and that funding could come from VCs or angel clubs, etc. The other is what we call the crossover, which is pretty much the pre-IPO part, right? So these are two different clubs or two different groups. And unlisted pretty much talks or covers both. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so to, to your question, absolutely, I think, uh, uh, you know, there has been a lot of interest from all investor groups uh, for unlisted. Hitherto, it's been limited or it was restricted or, you know, exclusive to the HNIs, UHNIs. Uh, but, you know, slowly, uh, you know, the transactional sizes are uh, getting smaller, which allows a lot of, uh, you know, people with 5 lakh, 10 lakh rupees to actually be able to invest in such stocks. And because of the awareness, because, you know, uh, I talk to a few people, few people talk to the uh, other people. So, uh, and, you know, we've all, uh, we all know about the, the appreciation in some of these unlisted stocks. So that's really caught the frenzy of the, the investing world. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, uh, while there is a frenzy and this FOMO, I think we need to know the basics as well before we, we sure. get in, right? And anyone, anyone who wants to invest. So we're starting with the brass tacks questions. Uh, and the first really being uh, the features of this unlisted security, sure. whether it is exactly the same as any you know, company issuing, uh, listed public company issuing shares, sure. or could there be differences here? Uh, how do we understand this as an equity instrument, first of all? Sure. 
So uh, ultimately, it's common equity, right? Unless uh, you know, it is let's say something like a preference share, uh, cumulative, uh, uh, compulsory convertible preference shares, all kinds of convertibles, mm -hmm. right? The point is that uh, what you see essentially in the listed market is pretty much common equity. What you see in unlisted uh, world is uh, mostly common equity, but sometimes some of these convertibles also trade, right? So you have to be careful uh, in terms of what you're really buying. And then of course, uh, you know, there is uh, the, the fact that, you know, uh, we also can't take away the opportunities that the unlisted world provides, right? There are, there are a lot of stocks, a lot of companies that you simply can't find such and such industries in the listed world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, we have you know, the, the, the world's biggest exchange in terms of turnover, uh, you know, being traded in the unlisted world, right? Which so, is the National Stock Exchange, NSC, right? yeah. Right, so those opportunities, you know, while you can find similar, let's say, uh, listed stocks, but, you know, uh, this stock or this exchange that I'm talking about is unique in its own, own right, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you will get such opportunities only in a listed world that will draw a lot of genuine investors' interest. However, uh, you know, further to your point, uh, you know, you have to be careful about liquidity, right? Because if there was one thing that uh, is paramount, uh, should be on top of investors' mind in terms of, you know, uh, what to expect from this 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 world is the liquidity, right? Mm. So uh, uh, you have to be careful. Uh, you know the stocks can actually really go rampantly up and down depending on the liquidity or the, rather the lack of it. Uh, you have to be careful about the uh, and again this is very unique uh, because it is ultimately a, 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 it's a it's a, a tra the transaction is not on the exchange, right? Transaction yeah. is across two counterparties. Yeah. So if I am buying it from you, mm. there is no exchange involved, there is no guarantee yeah. involved, right? So there is a credit risk to that extent. Yeah. Uh, if I want to buy a stock at, let's say, 100 rupees from you and we agree to that, right? Mm. Uh, before you actually wanted to transfer me and suddenly, let's say, for, for whatever reason, the stock went up to 125, mm. right? Uh, now, you may uh, be tempted to probably not sell me, in, in, in which case, yeah. what happens, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Having said that, uh, you know, these are some of the risks, but uh, it doesn't take away from the fact that uh, right now it's it's working on a, a, almost like a well-oiled machinery. There are a lot of... Uh, market participants, uh, mm. you know, a lot of uh, intermediaries, which yeah. have made it far lesser uh, risky than probably what it used to be three, four years back. No, absolutely. Uh, and we'll come to some of those mechanics. I want to you know, really get into the issue of exactly how sure. to buy, whom to buy sure. from, and how to sort of prevent uh, yourself from, from any potential traps. But before that, uh, Deepak, come in on the point on just understanding the instrument that, that we are buying, uh, even if it is common equity, uh, and also where you know, I as a buyer will stand in the hierarchy of investors because they could be the smarter guys, the venture cap guys, or, you know, private equity, all of that. So does everybody have equal rights? How do I know exactly what is this, uh, this piece of equity that I'm buying? Oh, yeah. I mean, in fact, there's so many nuances here. It's no longer as simple as uh, listed equity where everything is the same, right? So uh, first of all, you have two types of companies, a private limited company and a public limited company. A public limited company can be unlisted. The difference is number of shareholders in a private limited company is limited to 200. Uh, so you may, uh, there are other rules that apply. And then a public limited company has more open ownership. They can have more than 200. There are certain other restrictions. In a private limited company, they can actually say that uh, the board of directors can refuse to transfer shares. So you own a, own a shares of a private limited company. You want to sell it to me. Uh, the board can say, well, I don't want Deepak Shana on the cap table, so I'm sorry, you can't sell it. So they can do that in a private limited company. Uh, in listed companies, you cannot do this at all. So uh, public limited companies are somewhere in the middle in this case. There is uh, also the uh, aspects of what share you're buying. Like uh, Pranav said about the share holding of uh, common equity is basically the equity shareholder who's like at the bottom of the heap. Everything else is above that in the sense of uh, other shareholders may have more rights than you. Uh, common way to do this is uh, CCPS, a compulsory convertible preference share. But the preference shareholding has certain rights attached to it. There are four things that I'll talk talk about. One is that if it's a private, if it's a if it's an unlisted company, hmm. uh, uh, CCPS, which is above a common, can say that listen, uh, I'm giving you a thousand rupees, but if the uh, company's valuation uh, falls or, or is is the same, I will get my 1,000 rupees back first and then my percentage ownership in the company will participate in any sale. So the company is sold for roughly the same valuation. The uh, VC gets their money back first. Hmm. You may get a lot lesser back if you own common oh, equity shares. Okay. Then there are things called ratchet up clauses, which means if you sell at a lower valuation than they invested, their shareholding goes up. Consequently, your shareholding will also go down. There may be a right of first refusal saying, if you want to sell your shares to me, 
you have to go to the VC first and say, okay, will you buy my shares at the same price Deepak wants to buy it at? They can say, yes, I'll do it. In which case, I don't get to buy those shares. They have to, they can buy those shares from you. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of these clauses are parts of shareholder agreements. And uh, the person you're buying it from, you need to actually ask them about the capital structure of this company. Uh, and then if you buy, you know, uh, the common equity could be a thousand shares. Sure. But then the convertible equity could be a hundred thousand shares. So you may be uh, thinking that if I buy a hundred shares, I have 10% of the company, but it's actually 0.1%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, got that's, it. So I think, I think lesson number one is that ask all kinds of questions from the buyer with respect to the capital structure of the company, the nature of that instrument, any uh, sort of hidden clauses, any lock-ins that might be uh, accompanying, uh, any conditions that might be accompanying those shares. Uh, Deepak, actually on that point, I just want to go back to some of the questions that we were getting on social media. Uh, I mean, simple Tim saying that isn't the unlisted space inflated with VC money? So what's really the upside that I can hope for? Uh, then uh, Vijay Kumar was asking that question, saying that a lot of the VCs and promoters are actually now selling in listed public markets. So is this the best time to be looking at unlisted shares and, you know, or is this just bull market phenomena playing out? I mean, in short, are, are these concerns valid? Should one be uh, sort of, I mean, is, is the thought that in general, VCs will have the upper hand if you're getting into unlisted equity? Is there such, such a rule? Uh, two things here, Suri. First of all, I think we make too much of the fact that somebody else is making more money than us. Uh, the VC is making money, the promoter is making money, how can we make money? I think that's unfair to say because uh, in listed companies, uh, there was a listed company recently about two or three years back where um, um, the uh, the VCs sold, it was 2,500 rupees a share and they were selling. And uh, you might have thought that, oh, the VCs are selling. But guess what? That price went to 8,000 rupees a share after that. Uh, the VCs were selling for a different reason because after a company lists, the VC becomes your... Uh, becomes their worst enemy because the VC has received funds from their investors to take companies public, right? Mm -hmm. So they 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 grow them, nurture them, take them public. But after they're public, they don't have a mandate to hold them anymore. So they have to sell. So they become the sellers. So all of these startups that list, uh, they find these massive sales happening uh, six months after they're listed because that's when the lock-in period gets over because all of these VCs and uh, so on are trying to make deals to sell their shareholder shares uh, over to somebody else because they don't have a mandate to hold them anymore. So uh, in that context, you might actually get the company cheaper because they are being forced to sell rather mm -hmm. than, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, more expensive, rather than it being expensive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes VCs will make money, sometimes they won't. I think uh, we should uh, we should consider every opportunity individually and sure. not think that somebody blanket can statements. share. Got it. So, so there's no sort of uh, use of painting everything with one same brush. Got that point. So just be aware of your rights. Be aware of where you are in the pecking order uh, with respect to some of the other perhaps more influential shareholders. Now coming back to the question of mechanics. If you do intend to buy, how do you buy? Where do you buy? And what are the things to keep in mind? In fact, Radhika has sent us a question on this. Uh, this is a query on Instagram. Uh, you can remember, reach out to us on Insta as well. She is saying, does each unlisted company have a specific broker mandate? What is the minimum ticket size? Is there any lock-in period? Um, how do I exactly buy? How do I get to know about the pricing? So all very relevant questions, and I'm sure questions that will cloud anyone anyone's mind if they're a first-time buyer. Right, right, so right. let's go over the hygiene elements again, Pranav. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, Subhi, for most of the things, the answer could be different for uh, each company, mm, right? Mm, uh, mm. For example, uh, lock-in, yeah. right? Now, most stocks probably or most companies would not have a lock-in specified, right? But mm. some companies would. Right. Lock it in the sense you can't sell the shares. Yeah, in, exactly. in an, so if I, buy the, share, sort of, I, if I yeah. buy the share from you, yeah. uh, I can't sell the share for another year, right? Mm. So I should be aware of that, right? Mm. A lot of companies would not have. Uh, then I talked about the nature of the instrument, right? Whether it's a CCPS, whether it's a share, and yeah. if it's a CCPS, and when does it, or how does it convert, yeah. or what ratio, etc. I should be aware of that. Uh, and of course, ultimately, it's a uh, almost like an OTC or bilateral transaction, right? Mm. There is no exchange. So uh, if I want to buy a share for uh, unlisted equity A, I know that you're selling. Both of us will agree on a price, mm -hmm. right? Uh, on an email or otherwise would agree on a term sheet. Once that is done, I would transfer the amount of money to you, right? And as you as you receive the amount, you transfer the shares into my DMAT account. And typically, what's the best source? I mean, is it best to go to your stock broking firm? But a lot of people are 
you know, uh, now buying and selling listed shares right. on apps, so not right. necessarily right. even in touch with a physical broker, Absolute. right? Absolutely. So then, uh, what's the first portfolio? And that's that's how it's evolved, really, right? Yeah. If you yeah. had asked me that question three years back, four years back, uh, you know, we would all be wondering where to buy from because yeah. there were only a handful of players. Mm. Now, uh, this whole landscape is evolving, right? Mm. Uh, a lot of established brokers are actually now dabbling or getting into this business, which was again limited to a very unique set of players so far. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, like I said, the ecosystem is evolving. There are a lot of people, uh, you know, your wealth managers will actually, for one, would actually be able to help you out with that. Mm -hmm. It's very important uh, in such transactions to be aware of you know, the kind of uh, deal or the uh, price that you're getting into, right? Okay. Because unlike a listed world where, you know, you can actually see tick by tick, here, uh, you'll be given a price, you have to ensure that, because ultimately it's all valuation, right? So you mm. can't probably do too much of a fundamental analysis to figure out for yourself if it's right or wrong, right? Mm. It is ultimately what is the price prevailing in the market? How do you find that out, right? Yeah. So the best way again to do it is first of all, deal only with trusted intermediaries, right? People may want to or can build up to 10, 5, 8, 12%, whatever margin they want to. The best way to possibly avoid that is speak with a few people so that you can kind of average out yeah. and figure out what is yeah. the best price. Yeah, I, th I think that that's a great point to keep in mind because you don't have one publicly displayed price on a certain exchange. Sure. That's not how this market works. Fair enough. So we've got the, the basic groundwork in place now. Uh, the question is, uh, what do recent examples tell us? We'll pick up some uh, companies which are right now understood shares are trading. Some of them are sort of, uh, you know, in demand. But does that really mean that, does that guarantee wealth creation over a long term? That's the question after a break. Let's talk money.